After Broadcom's 2023 acquisition of VMware, it has sucked to be a small VMware customer, and it's only getting worse. And after the latest move of removing VMware vSphere, the free hypervisor, that's gonna turn the profession of being a VMware admin into basically being like a mainframe admin. We got stuff to talk about today, so let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH, and today we're gonna talk about something a little bit different. Instead of going through all the kind of cool hardware and showing you that, we're gonna talk about one of the most important things that's happening in this industry that I think too many folks are sleeping on. And that is just the fact that Broadcom is following its typical acquisition or post-acquisition strategy and really focusing on its larger customers and sacrificing its smaller customers. And as a direct result of cutting off learning opportunities and also small customer opportunities into the VMware ecosystem, this is really turning the VMware ecosystem more into something that's akin to the mainframe market many years ago. Now, the mainframe market is still around. It's still, you know, well and good. There are a few customers that still spend a lot of money on mainframes and being a mainframe admin is still something you can make a great living at. So I don't want anybody to think that being a mainframe admin, I think is a bad thing in any way. I'm just describing the size of the market and type of market for those skills. Now, for a lot of VMware small customers, all of these changes has meant that their livelihoods are now at stake. They may not be able to afford the new regime. And man, that is a lonely place to be, knowing that this company that you built your business on is going to charge you so much that you can't run your business anymore. So if you do have stories of increased pricing changes, if you have stories of like how this is impacting your business, thoughts, questions, any of that kind of stuff, please put that in the comments. We have so many folks that read or watch STH that are passionate about IT, and I just, man, the stories that I've heard are just heart-wrenching. Now, of course, we don't have a sponsor for this video. However, I just wanna say thank you to the STH YouTube members because I normally don't do these kind of videos, but I also really feel passionate about this one and I wanted to do it and your support makes it possible. If you wanna support us, you can always join down below. We also have super thanks and plenty of other ways that you can support us. So in 2022, the Broadcom acquisition of VMware was a deal that was announced. And if you don't know this about me, my background, uh, I have a JD, an MBA, and I used to do management consulting. So I used to do M&A, used to do stuff for private equity firms looking to acquire stuff, I used to do investitures, all of that kind of stuff uh, I used to do as a day job. And part of the Broadcom acquisition strategy is really to find companies that have few competitors and then to really focus the company on driving more revenue from its larger customers. That often means that it's sacrificing the smaller customers in the process. And that's exactly what's happening with VMware. If you were to go back to our 2022 piece of Broadcom announcing its intent to acquire VMware, you're gonna see coverage that is a lot different than what you probably saw from a lot of the large news organizations. And a big reason for that is that we've covered the impacts of Avago, which is now Broadcom's acquisitions in the past. For example, in 2016, we talked about how the PLX acquisition by Avago down Broadcom was a detriment to the NVMe industry. Really, we would have seen large NVMe arrays displace SAS arrays much faster had PLX not been acquired. And if you don't know PLX, PLX was a company that made the best PCIe switches. Now I know the Micro Semi or now Microchip folks are gonna disagree with that, but at the same time, it's hard to deny the fact that PLX switches are everywhere. If you see a high-end modern AI GPU server, it's gonna have PLX switches in it. And back in the day, PLX was by far the biggest manufacturer of these, and there wasn't really a lot of competition. There were a couple other companies that made them, but nobody was as big or anywhere near as big. And so the acquisition of PLX was a huge deal in the industry. What you saw was that the Vago Broadcom folks would actually go in and say like, hey, we're not gonna give you switches unless you go and start bundling stuff. They also increased the prices. I mean, we heard so many stories from different vendors talking about like how much more they're paying. And it wasn't like, you know, a 50% increase. It was like a multiple increase overnight of the prices of these switches. The fact that these switches didn't really have any competition meant that the price sensitivity was not that high. But on the other hand, it also meant that folks just wouldn't go build new cool architectures because of the cost of the switches. And I'll give you another great example of this. 
Broadcom is known for making network controllers, or NICs. HP is a company that traditionally used Broadcom controllers, and we had a really funny thing, or I don't know how funny it was, but it happened during our HPE ProLiant DL325 Gen 10 review. We got the system to review from HPE early, and when we reviewed that system, it had an onboard quad port Broadcom NIC. Then we went to go purchase more of these things because we had a number of these running in our lab a couple years ago. And when we purchased them, they no longer had that onboard four port NIC. Instead, that NIC was an Intel i350 NIC that was put into an expansion slot that we were using for 40 gig networking at the time. So two things, like number one, we no longer had our onboard networking. And so that was a total bummer. So I sent a note to the HPE folks. I was like, hey, what the heck is going on? And they said, oh, um, you know, we had to make a design change and that's why your four port NIC is now on an expansion slot. So I don't have this confirmed, but rumor has it what happened was that the Broadcom folks said, hey, cool that you designed our NIC in there. We're gonna be increasing the price of it. And uh, HPE decided, yeah, uh, we're not gonna play that game. We're just gonna go start adding Intel NICs in, even though we designed our motherboard and all that kind of stuff to have a NIC built in, um, you know, heck with you guys. And a fun little fact, you're gonna notice in a lot of our new server reviews that servers no longer have motherboards that go all the way to the rear of the chassis. This is one of the reasons for that. They wanna be able to design out vendors that increase prices by too much and cloud providers 100% wanna do that. By the way, the rumor on that one was that for like a $20 NIC, it would have increased the end price to go and continue using that Broadcom NIC by over $100. And that was on a you know server at the time that you could buy them for like 1300 bucks or so. And just to give you some scale of how crazy a $100 increase in cost would be on a server like that, a equivalent part from Intel, the Intel i350 AM4 or T4 NIC would have been something like, uh, you know, maybe $20 or so. And it's just a couple examples of acquisitions where the products all of a sudden got more expensive by like 3X overnight after they've already been designed in systems. And that really brings us to VMware because VMware has a amazing install base. I mean, if you have hundreds of thousands of cores or more running on VMware virtualization, that is tough to migrate. Also, you have all of your company's enterprise applications on there. How are you gonna migrate away from VMware? It's almost impossible. And VMware certainly has competition, but on-prem, you basically have Red Hat, and Red Hat has been increasing prices after the IBM acquisition. You have maybe Ubuntu could come in and do that, and a couple of other vendors for like large players, but there aren't that many options if you really want just virtualization. You also have someone like a Microsoft, which uh, you know I'm sure that they're very happy about this whole acquisition because their sales guys are probably having a field day with it. But because of that lock-in, Broadcom knew that if they bought VMware, they could go increase prices. And by increasing prices, they could drive more revenue out of an existing customer base without necessarily having to do crazy product innovation. But that's really talking about the revenue side and how you increase revenues and increase margins by selling the pretty much the same thing to your existing customers that can't switch. But for small customers, the opposite is almost the case where Broadcom is happy to give away that revenue if they don't have to service many customers because it costs money to service small customers. And that's the reason that Broadcom would do something like that. So over the last couple months, VMware has announced a number of changes to its programs. The first one that we covered on the STH main site was the end of perpetual licensing, moving everybody to a subscription model. Instead of having to upgrade with a new version, you now have the opportunity to continue to pay on a subscription basis even if there is no new version. And one of the cool things from a business perspective of having everyone on a subscription model instead of a you know upgrade on every new version cycle is that you can extend the amount of time it takes to implement new features. A really good example of that is think of Adobe. People aren't buying a new Adobe Photoshop version every time it comes out. Instead, you're now subscribing to Adobe Creative Cloud and you're paying, and even if there's no new feature for a year that you would use, then uh, you're still paying for that. Now we've covered on the STH main site, and we have some big tables on this, on you know the end to perpetual licensing, and also just kind of some things that where there's some like recommended ways to go and upgrade. But I want to talk about one that's uh, really important to a lot of folks, and that is the virtual cloud service provider program. Now the VCSP program was not one that like you know I don't I don't think that's the deal that VMware has with Amazon or Microsoft 
account or anything like that. This is really something that is designed for a lot smaller, I think, players. Or maybe I should say that a lot of smaller players use this and they were perfectly happy with the program. It may have been a little bit expensive, but it wasn't necessarily something that they would give up any day. Let's say, for example, that you ran a managed service provider and uh, maybe your customers included folks that you know had hot dog stands, maybe a local restaurant, a dentist, maybe a doctor's office, all that kind of stuff. And over the years, maybe you've increased the number of folks that you have, and maybe you have, I don't know, five, 600 cores or something like that in your overall just kind of infrastructure. And so at that point, you're probably paying 50, 60K a year to VMware. You probably don't really get any like action on your support anyway. So you're probably not really costing them a whole lot to support and you're just mailing in your money. But there are of course a lot of folks that are 100% happy to do that if it means that you know they can use software that they are accustomed to, they built their business on and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so the new version of that has just been presented to a lot of these small MSPs and uh, the new version, it starts at 3,500 cores. And you might be thinking at this point that, uh, you know, Virtualization has become commoditized in a lot of cases. Core counts are rapidly increasing. Maybe this is just resizing it so everybody can get 3,500 cores and all that kind of stuff. But the flip side of that is that a lot of folks, even with discounts, are seeing that the pricing has now increased to over $600,000. So maybe if you're at 3,500 cores, this is a you know double digit percent increase in the amount that you're spending. But if you are you know using a fifth or less of that, you're probably gonna see something like a 10X increase in prices. I mean, we've heard so many stories of that recently. And frankly, the difference between spending $60,000 and maybe 600 or $660,000 is, uh, is just one that means that a lot of businesses won't be able to use VMware anymore. And this is a perfectly normal strategy by Broadcom to say like, hey, we want to have at least, I don't know, half a million or $600,000 is kind of like our minimum customer size. Anybody smaller than that costs too much to service or whatever. And so we're just not going to focus on them. We're going to focus only on our bigger customers. But on the flip side, I mean, let's just take a second here. If you have an MSP and your business was based on VMware and VMware basically says, okay, cool, you can still have it based on VMware, but uh, you're going to pay us 10 times as much now. I mean, man, that is just an absolute killer. I, my heart goes out to those people. That's almost unimaginable to be faced with that kind of thing. Hopefully folks were reading the STH main site and had started their transition plans back in 2022, but you know, I'm sure there are folks that have not done that yet. Now, one of the challenges with cutting off all of these smaller players is that those are the pipelines, right? Those are the organizations that are starting on VMware. They are helping customers who are growing, right? Those MSPs, they may have a small customer today that grows into be a larger customer and they're now in the VMware ecosystem. The challenge is that those new customers no longer come in through that pipeline. But Broadcom and VMware took that to a completely new level. Just recently, when they took down the downloads for the free version of the VMware vSphere hypervisor, right? You can't get a free VMware vSphere hypervisor license, or you can't even download it now to be able to go and learn on. And I'm gonna give you a personal story of why I think that matters and how that's impacted VMware already. Almost a decade ago, we were looking at putting STH in co-location. The AWS instances that we had were uh, like seg faulting on us. Um, we already were running into like our bandwidth bills were going crazy. And so it was just cheaper to just go do co-location and buy like a mile. But part of that calculus was also the hosting software. Like what do we use just for infrastructure? And so at the time, you know, we looked at things like VMware uh, ESXi. We looked at the Hyper-V, which was kind of starting to gain a little traction action back then. Uh, we looked at doing just kind of bare Linux virtualization, which was, um, mm -hmm. we also looked at, you know, Zen, we looked at KVM, we looked at all that kind of stuff. We also tried a new product called Proxmox, which is kind of like a new project on the market at the time. And uh, over time we did Hyper-V, but we also ended up settling on Proxmox VE. And on STH, millions of people over the last decade have looked at our content on building various Proxmox clusters and all that kind of stuff. And they now are using Proxmox VE today. We could have been a VMware shop if there was a better program to handle someone like an STH. We would have been literally telling people for the last almost decade, hey, we use VMware, you should go use VMware, and we wouldn't have given any time to Proxmox. And that really brings us back to the idea of VMware admins becoming this generation's mainframe admin. If we were to go back a couple decades and you were to be a admin of like computer systems, you most likely were a mainframe admin. And then over time, less expensive alternatives came in that were cheaper to learn on and more organizations were also using the non-mainframe architectures. And once that started to happen, well, being a mainframe admin, you know, that became a specialized skill set that was only 
applicable to a smaller set of companies. And so if you wanted to get another job as a mainframe admin, your option was maybe to go from one bank to another bank, from bank to an airline or a railway or something like that. But you had to go to those few organizations that still ran mainframes. And they're still very popular today. I know that's a big industry and people make tons of money as admins and all that kind of stuff. I get it, guys. But on the other hand, you're probably not going to the average website and finding a mainframe there. And so if we look at the way that Broadcom has already started to transform the VMware business, you're gonna see a couple of telltale signs. One, the large customers can't really switch, just like mainframe customers can't really switch. And so the number of those, uh, you know, they're gonna still pay, they're still gonna pay a lot more for those. Mainframes are nowhere near the price of an x86-based system these days for a good reason. Smaller customers can't afford the new pricing structure as we've seen with the VCSP program and others. And so as a result, those folks are gonna have to start looking to alternatives very soon. Also, anybody looking to join the VMware ecosystem, they no longer have access to an easy mode where you can just go get a little system, download a free edition of ESXi and just get you know, playing and stuff like that. Instead, um, those folks are gonna go and experiment on other platforms. And oh, by the way, KVM virtualization is, uh, is everywhere. AWS uses it, a lot of the cloud providers use it. Proxmox uses it. Uh, a lot of the, you know, Ubuntu and all these guys, they're all using it. I mean, at some point you could already make the case that if you're gonna learn virtualization, you should be doing it on a platform that's not VMware if you wanna go and hit the largest market or largest potential job market that you can. And so just like the mainframe market of yesteryear, you're seeing the exact same thing. Smaller companies and folks just wanted to learn, they're not gonna be able to get access to a, the systems or the software. And so as a result, they're gonna go develop on other platforms and learn on other platforms, deploy other platforms. And that's gonna concentrate the number of companies that are using VMware to only be a few. And that's gonna kind of limit how many folks are gonna be able to get involved. Now, in all of these videos, I like to have key lessons learned, and I don't think that this should be any exception. So I think number one, if you didn't know this, whenever Avago, now Broadcom, uh, acquires companies, we tend to see a increase in price for its larger customers, but also kind of saying, hey, you know, if you're a smaller edge fringe player or something like that, uh, we just don't wanna service you because you cost too much to service as a small customer. That is a normal business decision that they're more than welcome to go make, but it does have implications for the ecosystem. For its smaller ecosystem, it's already playing out. We're seeing things like the VCSP program that uh, you know a lot of folks are seeing like 10x increases in like minimum pricing. Um, so like, you know, folks just aren't gonna be able to afford that, frankly. And we're also seeing things like the free vSphere hypervisor go away. And so, uh, you know, who's gonna go and pay money to VMware to learn? It's probably gonna be some folks, but it's uh, not gonna be as many as it used to be when you can get the hypervisor for free. And so I think that really shows how the profession of being a VMware admin is going to contract over time. But above everything else, I just wanna go back to the point that guys, if you have a story of how much your licensing is getting more expensive, how you're impacted by this, uh, you know, what you think of this, please go put that in the comments or put it in the STH forums. You know, we have a virtualization section. Man, I mean, what would be the worst thing is just find, waking up one morning, seeing these changes, and then feeling like you're all alone, right? Like you built your business on this company, you've been working with them for years, and then they basically said, nope, we're pricing you out of the market, so your livelihood's at stake and it's a challenge. I mean, guys, that's just, uh, that's a tough place to be. So maybe share what you're doing to get out of that ecosystem that you can't afford anymore. And the other thing is just share this video. Share it to your friends, colleagues, employees, customers, whoever, just so they know what's going on. And hey, if you did like this video, why don't you give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.